This episode of Friends of Flow is brought to you by NCLEX Mastery. If you're a nursing student and you're about to take your NCLEX, you need to go to the App Store right now and download NCLEX Mastery. Hello and welcome back. We're Friends of Flow and it's been a while since we got a chance to do a podcast because of the holidays. So we are getting back at it. My name is Dr. Tess Judge-Ellis and I have with me my colleagues, all of us colleagues. All right, Dr. Andrew Witters right here. And I'm Dr. Rebecca Porter. And so we're all nurses and if you've not joined us before, welcome aboard. We've been friends for a long time and colleagues and we like to solve problems and empower nurses through a scholarship approach to practical and really real issues. And today we are talking about truth telling or when our ethicist in residence expert, Dr. Porter, says is veracity. Hi, good morning. Well, I got talking to some nurses a little while ago and they were telling me a story that they were feeling really troubled. I I would use the word morally distressed because their patient was asking and the family was saying, will my husband survive this injury? And the nurses were pretty clear that the patient was not going to survive. And the physicians were not telling the patient or the family. The patient was unconscious. The family the truth. And the family were asking the nurse, is he going to die? Mm -hmm. And based on their years of experience and what I would call practical wisdom, as well as their own knowledge, they were pretty sure this patient wasn't going to survive and they really wanted to start helping the family prepare for that their loved one's death. So I went into the literature. Yes, Rebecca did indeed go into the (laughs) literature. So we had about nine articles to read that Rebecca sent out to us. I do love going into the literature. And of course, here we are. I like... I'm, I have Rebecca just print them out and give them to me. And Andrew has his on his phone that he's reading through. And so he's a <laughs> generation of I'm, that. I'm a literature searching junkie. I mean, within 10 minutes, she had this uh, lit search for us done. And so. Well, uh, Tessie found this really she, great article. She, of all of the articles, when we sat and had coffee and talked about this, of all the articles popped out to me is one by Margaret Rising who called Truth Telling in an Element of cultural, Culturally Competent Care at End of Life. And this is in the Journal of Transcultural Nursing, 2017, Volume 28, Issue 1, page 48 to 55. It's not long at all. But really, this article combines everything because I really love and got into cultural competence about 15 years ago or so. And then, of course, end-of-life care is really important. And also truth-telling, which got the veracity piece. So Mm -hmm. of these articles, I liked this one a lot. Can I just back up a bit here? When we think about being a nurse, Mm -hmm. we think about the core, core values or virtues that we enact as people and particularly as nurses. And those are our relationship with our patient is probably the most key thing, key driver in our work. And the second thing is how we communicate with our patients. Oh, so true. And the third thing is truth-telling, being an honest person. And when we balance all of those things, the relationship that we have with our patient, how we communicate with our patients and their families and one another, and the virtue of telling the truth, of veracity, that's one of the core principles ethical principles in healthcare. So relationship, patient relationship, Mm -hmm. yeah, some are arguing now that's the cornerstone value of nursing. It unites all of us nurses. So So if you're put into a position that your relationship is being compromised because of a communication problem or because somebody isn't telling the truth, where does that leave you feeling and how do you work through this? So that's what we want to talk about today. Mm -hmm. Tessie, Margaret Rising... Dr. Rising. She's a interesting. She comes, she has lots of letters behind her name, like all of us do in nursing. And I think she's a doctoral student out in Oregon, but I don't know yeah. for sure. As I was, we actually corresponded with her to see if she could, would call in, but she's teaching at this very minute. But she's actually trained it as an attorney. She has a JD, so it's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At the beginning of that article, she wrote a really interesting scenario. Do you want to just 
Yeah, I'll read this scenario. And I think it's interesting because when we talked about when anyway, I, I liked this article a lot that the case study that she brings up is a Chinese grandmother is in the hospital and dying of cancer. Her daughter serves as medical interpreter for several days. It is thought but not confirmed that the daughter is not telling the patient everything the doctor says about the grandmother's poor prognosis. Alone with the patient and the medical interpreter on the phone, the bedside nurse asks, do you have any questions for me? To which the grandmother asks, am I going to die? So have you had a patient ask you that, Andrew? Yes. Not so much with cross-cultural means, but what this article pulls out. But I think to the third point you brought up, veracity and truth, I think that there are oftentimes providers can hide behind the truth using a vernacular or complicated medical jargon. words. Jargon. Yeah, just jargon. Mm-hmm. Right. And so when patients pick up on it, I think they become confused, anxious. Mm-hmm. In, in those hospice or end-of-life situations I've been involved with, uh, you can see that the eyebrows start to raise and arms become crossed. People become frustrated, the patient's family perspective. And that's in the nursing wheelhouse then to sit down, or at least my approach is to sit down with the family and then define those words. So for example, if you have a chest x-ray and there is the word opacity, you know, uh-huh. well, what is that? Well, I mean, there's a little something there. And so, yeah. It's, so like there, yeah, it's an exactly. opacity. And so, mm-hmm. and so it's an opportunity for, for nurses then who do have relationships with patients and families to say, Hey, well, we look, might be looking at a possible pneumonia here or. Right. So when you um, were with, so for the, I think it's slightly different for nurse practitioners. I know when I was a nurse practitioner, I was the one that was telling people, right. Um, a diagnosis. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we would get into how you're going to live your life. But For nurses who are frontline, who are at the bedside and either standing with the team when this information is given, or you walk into the room after the physician team has been in there and you ask the patient, so what did they tell you today? And they look at you puzzled and look, well, they said something about something on my chest x-ray. Right. How you get at the truth. Mm -hmm. How do you get at that truth? And going back to... So that's one question. And is it within our legal and certainly our ethical purview to disclose information to patients? Some physicians believe that, or nurse practitioners who are in acute care, believe that it is only their, their responsibility to give test results or to discuss things. So what are you going to tell that bedside nurse from that scenario. How do we get at this practical wisdom and still use our legal and ethical frameworks to be in this kind of dilemma? Well, ethically, I think in in this situation, I would approach... Which one? Well, the one that you the read, Chinese, I suppose, um, or, or, or even the one that I, that I uh-huh. gave with a definition. If, if there's a bedside nurse who is getting questions from a patient saying, what exactly is this or what was I told? I think that's that's a, a point where you should go back to your you know prescriptive provider or whoever the and then say, hey, can we just define this as a team really quick and you know wrap up this plan of care? Like, let's button this up so the, the patient can understand it. And by the way, is it OK if I just go ahead and tell the patient what's What's going on? I mean, identify it like sort of a team communicator in that in that, in that situation. Um, so and also, we, but it gets back to some of the things that I liked about this article, and I don't know if I can go back to it, but it gets to, in particular, cultural humility. She does a great job with that, bringing up cultural humility. That, And I wish I could get to a good discussion about that. Well, we can talk about what the dominant culture is. And if we look at what the dominant culture is in United States, in most hospitals, it's white, English speaking, one of the three major world religions. And that's how that would be my worldview. So and that is where bioethics. Well, and that's where we informed, right? This that's autonomy. um, Right. And that's a very Mm -hmm. important thing is that not every culture values autonomy in the same way that Americans value autonomy. So if you go to the Middle East or to Eastern religions, 
Chinese or, or the East and places, for instance, in China, autonomy is not a valued principle of ethics. So it's the family. Well, and that too, and the other thing that she brings out here in this article too, Rebecca, is the manner in which we communicate. So she talks a lot, and there's in cultural competence, the understanding cultures, there's the high context culture, and then there's a low context culture. And Tell me more about that, Tess. Well, like a high context culture values family decision making, hierarchical of elders being more in respect than not. It values indirect communication not direct communication, and that kind of respect of elders, among other things. How you communicate is really important in a high-context culture and Chinese high-context cultures versus here in the U.S. and Canada and then some of the Scandinavian cultures where low-context, where we're kind of more direct communication. We tend to not be as reverent to and respectful of our elders as in a high-context culture. We value equality and equalness, and so she brings out nicely in the this article about how communication and how you communicate is just as important. And really what I think is interesting is really the standard of care and best practice is to inquire what the patients know, right? What they want to know and who else they want to know and how they want to know it. And then the other part that comes into this from this article that I'm reading by Kate Hodkinson in Nursing Philosophy is that what do we do when patients aren't asking the question that you think that Mm -hmm. they should be asking or the family isn't asking what you think they should be asking or maybe they don't know to ask or maybe they're afraid Mm -hmm. to ask. And so that comes from that low context versus high context. Right. And it's what it is, is a cultural clash of values. And that's what cultural humility asks us to do is to understand our own biases and assumptions and where they come from. So if I have a bias, an assumption that I want to know and you deserve to know, that's where distress comes from, is that not necessarily being able to filter where that pit of your stomach feeling that says, you ought to know this is important, you should know this. So that's a really good point then to stop and think from whose perspective am I looking at this. I go back to my reading and learning to understand some of Aristotle, Aristotelian philosophy, and he talks... Seriously? Aristotle? Yeah. We're going, okay, I'm going to put on my nerd hat right now, Rebecca, but go ahead. <laughs> Allow me. <laughs> humor me, Tash. I'm going to humor you. Yep, Aristotle. Very so cool. So Aristotle talks about our practical wisdom. The word that is used is phronesis. But we it. have to learn about practical wisdom. And what is practical wisdom? It's information, it's learning that passes on from generation to generation. It's not something that you learn in a book today. But it goes on to talk about, and that's what you are getting at, Tess, acting at the right point to the right degree for the right reason. Right. And so that's the basis of moral reasoning. So if you stop and think... Say it again, Rebecca. We act at the right point to the right degree for the right reason. Mm-hmm. So do And I that need, changes over time. It changes right? in so, context. And right, it changes right. all the time. And this is where the assessment is so important. And Rising brings this out too that it should be, we should regularly assess where people are at in what they want to know. Right. And it's through relationship and through communication style and being kind. So, right? what do you do? What are you going to do at the bedside? Tess or Andrew, I don't work at the bedside anymore. But when you're in a room with a patient and the son says to you, or through the interpreter, you are you learn that they don't want the family does not want the patient to know their diagnosis or their prognosis i would say the first thing you do is take a breath and see where you stand on this. If your gut is saying, oh my God, I don't know what to say, or if it's saying, I don't agree with this, or you find yourself getting angry and frustrated, which is what I would think you would mean by moral distress, is... Or feeling really guilty because you know something that they don't know, right? and they have a right to know, you think. Right. So, So I think that's the humility part of it. You know, you, I think when you're confronted with a real clash of values, and there's no more sacredness than 
end of life and these kind of intense and sacred moments that we hold with patients and and being in privilege to be in those positions. And it's about understanding yourself. And so when you feel like you're, when you feel upset, when you feel guilty, when you feel I should be doing something, that's when you kind of realize this is a clash. It's more about your own emotions. And so it's focusing on the patient and perhaps saying something like, do you need to know what's helpful for you at right now? And listening, being with the person and putting a little duct tape on your own mouth. So one of the things when the going back to the son that says, I don't want my mother to know. How are you going to respond? And as I thought about this, one of the things I thought is I still can honor truth telling by saying, I I will not directly tell the, your mother that she is dying. I won't offer that as information. But if she asks me, I will sit and talk to her. I will not, I cannot openly lie. Correct. So there is a way. So when we go back to that example that Dr. Rising has in her paper on her abstract. You know, what do we do with this case example? Here at NCLEX Mastery, we love nurses and especially nursing students, but we need your feedback about this podcast. If you have ideas on topics or you have questions you want us to answer, shoot us a message, leave a comment, go to our Facebook page and just tell us what you think because we want to help you in the most specific way that you need that help. Thank you so much. All right, we're back now with Friends of Flow. It's Tess Judge Ellis. All right, Dr. Andrew Witter is right here. And Rebecca Porter. And we're Friends of Flow. And we were talking about truth-telling and this in particular, this case from example on the paper from Margaret Rising. Go ahead. So going back to how that paper opened with the example test, can you just sort of summarize it really briefly? Sure. There's a woman who, grandmother who's Chinese. She's dying of cancer in the hospital. Eventually, the nurse is alone with the woman, and it's been kind of clear that the woman's not necessarily been told of her diagnosis. And so when the nurse is by the interpreter who happened to be her daughter, so the nurse, bedside nurse asks the grandmother through the medical interpreter, do you have any questions for me? To which the grandmother asks, am I going to die? And we were trying to talk about ways that you could approach this. And I think we started out with cultural humility, which is first of all, recognize your own Oh my gosh. What do I say? mm -hmm, What do I do mm -hmm. now? And you know, let's just say, you know, we're not perfect with this. You know, you're never going to know exactly what to do when this happens. And there isn't going to be a perfectly right answer. No, in fact, Rising goes in and offers a couple different ways to approach it, actually. So I just want to add in here that Mm -hmm. before you go into that, that no matter what route you take through these discussions, it probably isn't going to feel really good. No And kidding. so what, what that's and, called and, is know, it's called your moral remainder. Remor- <laughs> isn't that You're great? You're such a nerd. Oh, I love it. A moral it, remainder, which means that you're, we're always on a journey, aren't we? We're always on a journey. There's always junk left over that we will have to process. It sounds like they're good at math, though, too, if there's a remainder. A remainder. You know? uh-huh. I mean, it's like... <laughs> a decimal point. Yeah. Oh, I right? forgot that's about that. That's a great that. image. That's a great image. A okay, moral so, remainder. So M, what are we going to do? Big M, small R. You know, I mean... If you had to give it a context. Well, you know, and I guess going back to like, how can you help the new nurse? First of all, the and Rizin goes on to say in this paper and, and bring up that, you know, oftentimes patients know when they ask this sort of thing. And there's a wisdom that people bring forward with them. All right. So take it home. If you have these episodes, take them, take it home with you. Do your own work. Journal. Talk to a wise person. An, an talk older to a nurse chaplain that you or whoever is respect. A, an older nurse that you respect. Absolutely. Do a little personal work and then set it but aside. You're at the bedside test. I know. And if you're at the bedside and you're busy, right? Practitioners as well. For sure. I do a lot of counseling that way and nobody's, and it's only because, you know, I've been doing this. I've been a nurse for 30 years and NP for 20 years. And you, are you 50 years? No, 30 years. I just, 30 years as an RN this year, actually. Really? Um, St. Louis U. So uh, a couple options for this. So when patients ask, am I dying? They might, you know, she brings up an interesting point in the paper about hope and that sometimes when you people or cultures that don't want to tell the full truth don't want to extinguish hope. That's mm-hmm. a really important test. Mm-hmm. I think that sometimes you can say, what are you hoping for? And people will say, I've had friends or patients who have said, well, they told me there's no hope. 
Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and there's never not hope. It's what we are hoping for. Mm-hmm. When providers tell somebody there's no hope, no hope for you now, what they're saying is that from my perspective, my hope is that I was going to cure this disease, that you would not die of this. But there's no hope of that now. My perspective from thinking about this over years as a, as a nurse is that there is always hope. There is hope for a peaceful end of life. There is hope for helping somebody find meaning in every day and on the day that they're dying. There is always hope. There's a poem, Hope is Like a Feather. Look oh. that one up. And it's a beautiful poem that talks about how a feather flits down from the sky and changes direction. And that's like our hope when people are asking a question. So when you are at the bedside, when you're in that exam room with a patient and they ask, am I dying? We're going to answer that question intuitively. We're going to use our own practical wisdom from other experiences that we've had, but it's really important, like Tess said earlier, to be able to reflect on that and think about this, to journal it, to talk about it with people that you respect about how these decisions are made and what kind of person do you want to be and what kind of nurse do you want to be in that relationship with that patient at that point in time. And so it's not something that you can just fly in the room. And that's sometimes when these questions come up. It can be in the middle of a nurse giving a bed bath and the patient will say, do you think I'm dying? And it's those intimate conversations. It can be when you are taking a glass of water to a patient and they say, do you think I'm dying? And that's when you sit down and I think one of the first things you say is, tell me more. And that's one of my, when I'm trying to take a breath, when I'm trying to think, oh, what the heck do I say now? Is not to answer except with another question question of like, tell me more. I think that's a patient advocacy role that nurses can take on is asking your patients what they understand and then having them define their goals based on what they know about their diagnosis. And if that diagnosis needs additional definition to use the resources that are available to define it for them. In some cases, even, even with asking patients, well, what are your goals? And if a patient's like, oh, I don't, I don't know, then that's where even a bedside nurse can say, well, let me reach out to my social worker and let's talk about this some more. I think it's important to ask people what this means to you rather than what you understand. When you say understand, sure. yeah. I okay. think asking for understanding is like putting somebody on the hot seat. And instead, if we can get people to, what does this mean to how you're living your life right now? For sure. Because I, I don't think people want to be put on the hot seat. They're already there. If they're in their office, if they are in your office or lying in a bed, they are already really vulnerable. And if we can turn that question into, what does this mean for your life right now? Well, that's our charter as nurses is to be present in the lived experience. I'm going to go back to that cultural humility is, you know, we have our biases and assumptions. How can we not? You know, we're raised in our own culture. And, you know, if you're raised in a strong truth-telling autonomy, people ought to know kind of culture. And you bring that always with you, you will be in a great deal of distress because of that. So when the son or the, the son mm-hmm. through, or the daughter through the interpreter says to you, stop, I don't want them to know this. They're, I'm not telling them that. One of the avenues then is to say, tell me more. Tell me about your relationship with your mother. Tell me more about your mother. What does she like? What's her life been like? How has she reacted to difficult things in the past? How do you handle things as a family? Right. Is it better to, I mean, to tell truth and, and cause disruption in the family? Or is it better to engage the daughter so that the communication style is consistent with their family values to move forward in uncovering what really is going to work best for the mom? And again, that comes back to that place of humility and compassion. Um, yeah. So what are you going to say if you are a new nurse, if you are Cause isn't there a staff benefic- nurse, how are you going to approach your physician team with this when they want to just go in and barge in and start having a conversation because they have limited time. And you have limited time. You've got several other really sick patients that you are running around to, or you've got a waiting room full of people waiting to talk to you. How are you going to interact? How do you stand up and have another kind of virtue, which is courage? And I think that this is part of the podcast 
is empowering nurses to say, first of all, your assessment is moving forward to get to know your patient and where they are at in their knowledge of things and explaining things to people and taking time to do that, which I think is the movement from novice to more expert, journeyman expert is, okay, I've understand the pumps. I've got my day figured out in decades since I've been an inpatient nurse, but my schedule, my day, the pressures that have to put bear and then think, I wonder, you know, I wonder where they're at with what's going on. I just I just know that they had a troublesome visit by the team and I need to, or by their doctor, and I better go back in and follow up and see if they have any questions. Just be with them in a certain presence. And the word, tell me more. Tell me more. Tell me more. And I don't know, Andrew, what do you have to say about that? I agree. I think I I would encourage a new nurse to think about his or her resources that are available to care for their patient. So if, if there is this ethical situation at hand where there's cross-cultural issues and a true knowledge deficit to pull in a nursing diagnosis. I would encourage the new nurse to look at the whole body of resources that are available in, in a care situation. So I, well, I'm thinking not just a another provider liaison, but a, a social worker, a chaplain. So that would be um, who, perhaps who are you thinking, if, if Andrew? If time is a constraint for the nurse, pull in a social worker. A social worker is usually... A chaplain. That's sort of their wheelhouse to sit down and chat with the patients a little more, send out those tentacles of... And pallet, palliative care people are usually really good at these conversations as well. I would just take a step back and just think a little more globally mm-hmm. about... What else do I have in my my arsenal of, uh, of resources for this this care situation? And then, very importantly, I think we should close with the importance of caring for yourself. Yeah. That after you have been through an emotional discussion or what you find is a very distressing conversation with a patient or a family member, is how are you going to care for yourself right now in the moment to be aware of how you are feeling that I feel guilty, I feel angry, I feel upset. This is how would I need to care for myself in that moment. How am I going to get through, if it's impacting me, how am I going to get through the rest of my shift and to really think about it? Do I need to go get a cup of coffee? Do I need to go sit in a stairwell for five minutes to gather myself and think about this? What am I going to do on my way home? What will I be thinking about on my way home? And what would I be telling my best friend to do? Yeah. Because I am my best friend. And and so that self-care part, I think, is we've always got to circle back to how am I looking after myself, being mindful of my own responses and being mindful of my own responses to this situation. And then when you get home, one of the, one of the really important things to do, both at home and at work, is to be in a place of gratitude. Oh, clearly. And to tell people at work when they've helped you. I'm grateful. Thank you for that. And on your way home is to think of two or three things that you were grateful for about the day. Research has shown that it's really important. One of the best things we can do for ourselves is to either talk about or write down three things that we're grateful for that day. And it really does help us process things. You know, there's no easy answers to these things. And these mm-hmm. are difficult situations that leave you with that moral remainder. That kind of weirdness that says, I went through something and it was, it left me feeling like there was no perfect answer. And so you return to being kind and Compa- that we were with someone, we were being with them in distress. And so. I think um, it is the way of being a nurse. That we live in a world of wanting certainty. That we want to be certain that we've always done the right, the best, the true. And our lives are not like that. I know, we're getting really waxing poetic right now, aren't we? But I think it's important what we can end with is that... You're doing a good job. You're doing a good job. You're doing a good job, folks. Keep it up. Nursing is a privilege and a lovely, lovely profession. It's hard work. It is hard work, but it is the... It's frustrating at times. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, the system makes it that way. That's true. You know, it's the system. And this is why nursing is so great, is we're (laughs) going to change the system. Yeah. It may take decades, but nursing's voice, its time is right now. I agree. And these, and discussions like this on philosophical and bringing in all this type of knowledge from even Aristotle, as Rebecca quoted. 
<laughs> Even Aristotle informs us. And mathematics us. with remainders. And, and mathematics with remainders. This is so important because if we don't have this basis, we lose and we get sucked into the system. We get sucked yeah. into the business of medicine. And as nurses, we can't. We have to keep moving forward. And, and, right. and we have to, as nurses, stand up. And part of it is taking the time to reflect. And yep. I think that the moral distress that we feel, the moral remainders that we feel are all teaching us. We should welcome them. Welcome them. Welcome them. That's part of interacting. It's happy, it's yep. happy yuckiness because we're growing and stretching. Right. It's when you stay and wallow in it and right. it ruins your day and you don't talk to anybody and you seclude yourself with a bottle of wine and bad Hallmark, well actually I love Hallmark movies, but mm. Hallmark movies and you don't grow and learn and talk to others. Right, Andrew? Agreed. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. I think we better sign off for now, don't you? On a happy so Everybody about- take care. Reflect on what you're doing. Know that you you know what you're doing and be good and be kind to yourself too. And keep your eye on the patient. Take a deep breath and enjoy your caring of others. This is Andrew telling you to innovate, agitate, and educate. Friends of Flow is brought to you by NCLEX Mastery. Go to the App Store right now. Download NCLEX Mastery. And before you leave, if you could just Share this with your nursing friends. Tell them about us. Leave us feedback. Go to our Facebook page. Tell us what you liked. Tell us what you didn't love so much. Be nice. But thank you so much. We really appreciate you.